Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mark Remus, and I'm an Associate Scientific Director with the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging, and I'm going to be hosting today's webinar. And just as a note for procedure, we have disabled most people's talk features because if too many people have the talk feature activated, it creates feedback. So with respect to questions from the audience, after our speaker finishes her presentation, we will take questions from the audience. But please type your questions in the chat box. That should be at the lower left of your screen. And I will read out the questions to Heather. So we'll get going now. It is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Dr. Heather Keller is a professor in the Department of Kinesiology at the University of Waterloo. She's an expert in nutrition in older adults, and in her research, she attempts to improve the nutritional state and health of older adults, whether they be community-dwelling adults or whether they live in institutions. She's developed a wide collaborative network for research in community and clinical settings, and she has a great role in translating this research and knowledge to practitioners, families, and older adults. She has three primary research streams, all in nutrition, risk screening, nutrition and healthy aging in older adults, and nutrition and dementia. Heather has actually developed one of the tools, the screen tool, that we are currently using as a data collection measure in the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging. And she'll be talking about older Canadians, food intake, and nutritional status, how the CLSA will advance knowledge. Heather? Great. Thanks very much, Mark. It's a pleasure to talk to you today about the research that is going on in Canada around nutrition and to specifically talk about the CLSA and how it can help us to know a little bit more than we do know now about older adults' nutrition habits. First off, I want to clarify some key terms for you, specifically what is malnutrition, nutrition indicators, nutrition risk, and how we assess nutrition status then why nutrition is relevant to looking at specifically in older adults, some of the sources of information we already have on nutrition for Canadians and specifically older adults, what do we currently know about the food intake uh, of these older adults, and then launch into some of the key features of the CLSA and specifically the screen tool and some research questions that can be addressed with this uh, wonderful data set that we have available to us. So first off, malnutrition is um, Depending on who you talk to, you might get a different definition of malnutrition, but I really like this definition because it seems to encompass the range of what uh, we think of when we think of someone not having the nutritional intake to meet their needs in a way that's going to support their health and function. And so it's an old definition from the World Health Organization that works well because it covers not only the undernourishment that can result from insufficient food intake, but also overnutrition caused by excess food intake. And more specifically, it also identifies that this can be a nutrition, nutrient deficiency itself or an imbalance due to disproportionate food intake or nutrients being utilized in the body. The key is that when these things are happening, they're malnourishment when they affect the body tissues, the function, and the overall health of an individual. If we think about nutrition indicators, that's usually a single parameter that tells us something about a component of the nutritional status of a person. So we think about body weight, for example, uh, a blood measure such as serum albumin or hand grip strength. All of those are single parameters. They tell us something about nutrition, but they may not give us the whole picture of nutritional status of the individual. Nutrition risk, on the other hand, is thinking about the concept of the fact that you have a variety of these potential risk factors or indicators of malnutrition that will, if they continue to move forward, lead to malnutrition in the individual. And so it's a, a trajectory we think of, that people are on a path of not consuming sufficient nutrients to meet the body's needs, and if they continue on that path, they then start to have the physical deficits around function and health, which is malnutrition. In the acute care setting, we often think of it this way, and this is a, um, a model put up by White et al. in 2012. And so, again, you see this idea that it's a trajectory or a, a linear path from being well-nourished to severely malnourished. And it can lead, um, it can be part of the, the reasoning is 
lack of food intake or inadequate food intake. But in the acute care setting, we also see often inflammation because of the disease state or the acute care challenge that is uh, occurring in the body leading to inflammation. That, on top of that impaired food intake, leads to increased requirements for the uh, for person to meet their needs. And when those two things go in combination, we get much more severe malnutrition. So you move quickly from being um, well-nourished and, and into moderate malnutrition when you have inflammation and lack of food intake. And then finally, we see severe malnutrition when we see hypermetabolism or catabolism, which might be seen with a trauma, for example, in acute care setting. So someone could be well-nourished on a Monday, but be severely malnourished a week or two later if they've gone through a significant trauma that's caused hypermetabolism and catabolism. In the public health sector, we also think of it as a linear process, but we often think a little bit more upstream in terms of risk factors that lead to impaired food intake, which over a long period of time, if that continues, starts to lead to the issue of subclinical malnutrition or overt malnutrition. So if you look at this slide on the far left-hand side, you see the determinants of food intake. And this would be things like socioeconomic status, um, living situation. When we think of the risk factors that can lead to poor food intake, specifically for the older adult, these are things like appetite, poor appetite, swallowing problems, chewing problems, having food-related activities of day living problems, such as um, lack of um, grocery shopping capacity or transportation to a grocery store. All of these would be risk factors that could impair food intake. And Food intake is often the first thing we see changing in the older adult in the community setting that might suggest that they're having a problem with malnutrition. If that continues long term, they move into subclinical malnutrition where we start to see body changes such as body weight and anthropometric changes or biochemistry changes. That becomes overt malnutrition when that, um, those changes are significant and start to affect the function of the body. So you can see here that in addition to giving this linear process, this diagram also shows where primary prevention can be used in terms of looking at the determinants of food intake and risk factors that may be present, where secondary prevention, specifically screening, might be useful in terms of identifying individuals who are at risk. And then finally, tertiary prevention, where we know someone has the condition of malnutrition and trying to reverse it. On the bottom part of this, slide in this diagram, we also see potential interventions that might be used. You can see that in a public health framework, this would vary, obviously, as compared to acute care. So in the public health area or primary care, interventions like education, um, interventions that address the risk factors like cooking skill or meal programs that overcome the issue of access to food in the community, those are all the interventions that would help to address the issue of nutrition risk and our malnutrition. And when someone becomes overtly malnourished, more targeted interventions such as um, meal supplementation or individualized counseling are useful in this setting as well. I now want to turn our attention to what we mean by nutritional status and understanding how we assess that. So malnutrition, as I've given you the definition, is a very um, diverse concept, looking at both overnutrition, undernutrition, as well as micronutrient deficiencies on their own are the imbalance of those, and they impact the function and health of the individual. So how do we figure this out? There basically is no single indicator that sufficiently describes the nutritional status to determine malnutrition or nutrient deficiency. This means that we have to look at a a variety of parameters or nutrition indicators to get a sense of the actual nutritional status of an individual. And clinical expertise is needed to differentiate which indicators to use when to fill in that picture. Standardized measurements that are used that are comprehensive, an example would be the subject globe assessment. It actually covers off many of these components that are on the circle here of what we would consider part of an individual nutrition assessment. So typically, when a dietitian or another practitioner who does nutrition um, uh, assessment does it, they include some or all of these components when looking at nutritional status of the individual. So they want to know something about the food intake of the individual. They want to know something about the body composition, so fat mass versus muscle mass, or even uh, skeletal mass in terms of, of bone. Clinical exam, looking for risk factors that might lead to impaired food intake or utilization of nutrients in the body. 
physical exam, which shows us some of the potential nutrient deficiencies or lack of energy and protein and macronutrients specifically in the body. And then finally, biochemical measures, which might be used for individual micronutrients like B12, for example. As I said, no single indicator gives us the clear picture. If we take, for example, B12 itself, serum B12 has challenges with being able to identify clearly when someone has a subclinical or full deficiency of B12, so a single measure on its own doesn't work. We need to look at a variety of measures across these components to get a true sense of nutritional status. So you can see that when we're trying to look at nutritional status and diagnose malnutrition, it becomes very difficult in the context of research and in the context of surveillance, such as the CLSA and other uh, large court studies and other uh, surveillance tools that have been put into place. As a result, what we see instead being used is often individual indicators like body mass index or body weight and height. And people use these as a crude indication of the potential nutrition problems for our population and individuals within that population. We also see indices being used. Body mass index is actually an indice, taking the weight in relation to the height of the individual. There's other indices out there that are also used that look at biochemical measures, for example, in addition to body weight and maybe age and gender. There's also standardized checklists that are used. And then finally, there's screen tools that have been used and developed. One is screen two, which we'll talk about in more detail as it's used in the, CL in the CLSA. There's also the mini nutrition assessment, which is developed specifically for older adults in a clinical environment, SNAC, MST, which is non-nutrition screening tool, and NUST, which is a similar um, uh, screening tool used in the UK. All of these have been validated and tested for reliability but they may not be necessarily validated in a realistic situation. So just to give you an example here, um, some of these tools have used researchers to actually um, compare the screening tool to the criterion that they consider to identify malnutrition. That's not the real life scenario when we're doing screening. We typically want a frontline person doing the screening who may or may not have very much education around nutrition to identify nutrition risk. So some of these tools may not be validated for the context specifically in the community setting for the CLSA when we think about that. As well, they're not necessarily relevant for community or public health context. Many of these tools look at significant weight change and impaired food app appetite or food intake and neglect to look at some of the risk factors that are much more upstream, such as appetite, uh, swelling problems, chewing problems, etc. So now let's turn our attention to why malnutrition is a relevant issue for us to be looking at when thinking about older adults in Canada. We know that in acute care, that if someone comes into the hospital in a malnourished state, they're more likely to have more morbidity, a slower um, healing of the wound if they have an um, existing wound on their body, more likely to have infections during that hospital stay, more complications, and a longer convalescence. All of those lead to impaired quality of life for the older adult. They also translate, obviously, into healthcare utilization issues. So we typically see, on average, two days or more stay for a hospitalized patient who is malnourished. This is often due to increased treatments because of complications and infections and wound healing problems. We also see a heightened level of mortality in hospital and within 30 days of hospitalization. And we know from studies throughout the world that the cost of malnutrition in the acute care setting are approximately 60% more than they are for a person who is well nourished. We have much more data in the acute care setting than we do have in the community settings. That's why I present these data for you to show you the importance and the relevance of nutrition. We need to remember, though, that people become malnourished in the community and they come into acute care in that state. So malnutrition is definitely occurring in the community and also likely has significant effects on health and outcomes for patients um, or individuals living in the community. When we look to literature about chronic disease, I've just shown a few key studies here and, and some common knowledge that we have about diet and chronic disease. We know that if we limit saturated fat, cholesterol, and trans fat, this can prevent cardiovascular disease. We also know that if we emphasize the omega-3 fatty acids, DHA and EPA, 
they can promote cardiovascular health and improve insulin sensitivity. We also have a long standing body of literature that says fruit and vegetable intake are associated with decreased cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and cancer. And fish intake is associated with decreased cardiovascular disease. So we know these things about diet and need then to support the practices around high quality nutrient diets, dense diets for older adults to promote their nutrition and overall health. Specific to the older adult population, we also know that food intake and a nutrient-dense diet promotes less frailty. If we take the example of dementia, we know that a high saturated fat diet and a diet high in calories and alcohol is associated with the incidence of dementia. We also know that these diets are often low in antioxidants, fish, methionine, and other vitamins. In a study that was prospective, Sun et al. identified that women who had a low protein intake at baseline, about 0.7 grams per kilogram per day, lost 40% of their muscle mass over a three-year period as compared to those who had a higher protein intake at 1.1 grams per kilogram per day. This shows very directly the impact of protein itself on the um, skeletal muscle structure of older adults. And now this has changed our thinking about sarcopenia and how we might address frailty in older adults in terms of nutrition as well as exercise. In these women, they also saw low levels of serum vitamin D, carotenoids, selenium, zinc, B6, B12. All of those also predicted disability. So back to the point that a high quality diet not only prevents chronic disease, but also promotes uh, well-being for the older adult and perhaps potentially um, decrease the incidence of dementia as well. In terms of Canada and our nutrition information, I've tried to accumulate here as much as I know of the various nutrition surveys that have been done um, in the last uh, 20 or 30 years or so. And I'm sure I'm just a few here, but these are the key ones that are out there that are available in terms of data that we know um, has been useful for describing the nutrition intake and nutritional status or nutrition risk of populations in Canada. So back in the 1980s and 1990s, there was a series of provincial surveys funded by each provincial government uh, that were done, and they included things like the food frequency questionnaire or 24-hour recall to try to understand the food behaviors of individuals and specifically older adults. The CCHS 2008 used the screen to the abbreviated version, which I'll describe a little bit more in detail later, as well as general health measures. The Manitoba follow-up study also used Screen 2 since 2007 in its nutrition survey component. The Canadian Health Measures Survey includes height, weight, and micronutrient status, as well as a food frequency questionnaire. And it goes up until, I believe, the mid-70s in terms of the age range of the population that's included. And then finally, we have the NUAGE cohort, which is probably the most in-depth nutrition study ever done in Canada to date. It included three 24-hour recalls, a food frequency questionnaire, and several nutrition indicators, as well as robust measures around health, well-being, and quality of life. So what do we know from those studies that have been conducted to date? Well, in general, we got from the surveys that were done in the 1980s and 90s since that poor intake was occurring across all four food groups in the older adult population. We see this across all of the surveys that were done. We also saw for those surveys that did uh, micronutrient analysis that several nutrients were consumed at low levels. From the CCHF 2.2, which is the 2008 survey, we found that older adults, 65% did not consume five fruits and vegetables a day. And we know that 34% of older adults are at nutrition risk using the screen 2 abbreviated tool. So this demonstrates a significant um, challenge when thinking about nutritional status and nutrition risk as well as food intake of older adults in Canada. So why does poor food intake occur in this population? A variety of studies identified such things as food apathy, reduced physical capabilities, restricted income, depression, social isolation, neglect, medication use, cognitive impairment, dentition, and multimorbidity as reasons why poor food intake occurs in older adults and makes them especially vulnerable to poor nutrition and even malnutrition. In the CCHS 2008, we show here the prevalence of some of the key risk factors that might be promoting um, poor food intake in the population. 
So just for example, 42% reported a low, were in the lowest income bracket, 49% were living alone, 44% had disability. Again, this is a population survey with the telephone um, administration being used. So this is a, a, a population sample and to see the prevalence of some of these risk factors and determinants of food intake and nutritional status um, demonstrates, again, the relevance to us of why we should be looking at nutrition and trying to promote better uh, quality diets, nutrient-dense diets for older adults in Canada. In terms of looking at specifically the prevalence of nutrition problems in Canada, we have that population sample from the um, Ramage study based on the CCHS 2.2, 2008. And here are shown the risk level, 34%, as well as some of the key uh, variables on the screen to abbreviate tool to show the prevalence of individual variables. On the right hand side, I show a vulnerable sample which was recruited from 23 service agencies in three cities in southwestern Ontario. And these individuals were attached to, for example, Meals on Wheels programs or convict dining programs. And so they're much more vulnerable than the population sample from Stats Canada. But you can get a sense of uh, the divergence in the prevalence of risk as well as some of the key risk factors. So for example, you see that 37% had low fruit and vegetable intake in the Stats Canada sample versus almost 50% in the vulnerable sample. With the Manitoba follow-up study, the screen two was used as well in that survey, so it's a nutrition risk measure. 19% were considered to be at high risk. However, they improved over five years, showing that incidental weight change decreased that risk for older adults. This is the power of using a longitudinal analysis, uh, a data collection analysis like the Manitoba study. We can see that actually people can improve, and what are those things that predict that improvement? 20% that were at low risk declined over five years, and that risk was attributed to, that increased risk was attributed to decreased appetite and low food intake for the population that was part of that study. Nutrition risk was also associated with five-year mortality, and with each point decline in the screen two, there's a 4% increase in mortality in adjusted models, showing again the importance of nutrition as being an independent predictor of health outcomes in the population. This study also supports the validity of the screen too because they demonstrate the predictive validity around mortality of this tool. In the Canadian Health Measures Survey, the 60 to 79 year age group, there's been some data uh, reported in the literature. About 31% had dental treatment need based on the assessment of the, uh, the dental uh, 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 dentition of the individual. 25% had vitamin D less than 50 nanomoles per liter when they used serum measures for that. Those who drank one or more glasses of milk a day had a mean level of 75 nanomoles per liter versus those who did not consume milk. So showing the, demonstrating the benefit of even just one glass of milk a day in terms of the vitamin D level. And then another key stat that I thought was relevant to this group was 6% of women had a low ferritin, showing potentially anemia in the population as well of older adults. So snippets of data to show you what we already have, <laughs> excuse me, but also the, the potential need in terms of doing more research around nutrition. So for NUAGE, which is the most robust data collection to date in Canada around community living sample and food intake and nutritional status, this study has provided a lot of research around uh, our understanding of nutrition in the community and is a way forward when thinking about the CLSA and further studies that could be done. Weight dissatisfaction, for example, is identified in almost 51% of older adults in, the, in, the, um, in this uh, group of individuals. Anorexia of aging was common at about 7% and obesity about 25%. So showing the range of things that we're thinking about when it comes to nutritional status in the older adult population, we're seeing everything from anorexia through to obesity and, of course, weight dissatisfaction there as well. In terms of antioxidants being consumed, we find that uh, the food intake um, consumption was positively associated with serum values, so it validates some of that, those serum measures in terms of looking at that, but also shows the robustness of the uh, food data collection measures in the nuage. And finally, positive determinants of diet quality in women are higher education, diet knowledge, number of meals and hunger, and negatively associated with diet quality with dentition. So some of these associations with food quality and with diet quality are relevant when thinking about the CLSA data because we have many of these robust measures as well around risk factors and determinants of food intake that might be relevant to look at in future research.
So onto the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging. The benefits of this data collection is first that it's longitudinal and it's going to allow us to understand deterrence and exposure associated with specific outcomes in a way that we had never been able to do before because it's long-term data collection over many years. It's a cohort study of sufficient size, even considering attrition that might happen over time. So we'll be able to explore in detail some key ideas and notions around nutrition and how it may be impacted by various risk factors. And so we can see potential for sub-studies of selected populations who might have a very specific determinant we want to look at because of the robustness of the sample size will have that capacity in this data set. As well, we see aging from very diverse perspectives, and there's a larger age range than um, just the older adults. It goes from 40 and onwards. And so there's multiple dimensions of aging, and a process of healthy aging can even be picked up with some of the data that's being collected. And so it gives us more of a robust picture, I think, in terms of thinking about how to promote better health through food and nutrition education and uh, other quality practices for the older adults. There's lots of modifiable factors that have been put into the data collection, the things that we can change, not things that we cannot change, such as disease state, for example. This allows us to think about interventions, if we can understand better what some of these things that are influencing food behavior may be. And finally, there's been a large collection of researchers involved in this data collection providing their expertise to the selection of measures as well as the inclusion of a variety of, of uh, data collection procedures to make sure that this is a high quality and rigorous data collection. As a result, this is an unparalleled research opportunity in Canada and uh, will be exceptional in terms of looking at nutrition research as well. Specifically, some of the methods of the CLSA, it's 50,000 50, individuals, 45 to 85 years of age, and they're being followed for 20 plus years. There's repeated data collection every three years, and there's a core questionnaire which has demographics, social, physical, clinical, psychological, economic, and healthcare use. 30,000 of those participants go through the CLSA comprehensive, where they have in-person physical measures, including blood, urine, physical exam, diet, medications, disease symptoms, a neuropsychological exam, and physical measures. The CLS tra tracking is a telephone interview for 20,000, which are representative of the Canadian population, and it's based on the CCHS 2008 sample. They have questionnaires that are being used to track the population over time. As well, there's an annual questionnaire based on data collection to retain the sample, and there's the opportunity to link administrative data sets through the health record number, such as getting a sense of hospitalization of an individual. So very robust data collection. To look specifically at the comprehensive um, group, the 30,000 or so, there's functional performance measures, activities of daily living, instrumental activities of daily living, grip strength, balance, physical functions such as balance, four meter walk, time up and go and chair rise, waist to hip ratio, blood pressure, bone mineral density, aortic calcification, as well as carotid intima media thickness, height, standing, sitting, and weight, and blood and urine are stored and measured for key uh, variables. The questionnaires that are part of this uh, comprehensive group of patient or group of participants include falls, pain, oral health, diet supplements, and the, the nutrition of a screening tool, which is screen to abbreviated, we'll talk more about in just a moment, physical activity, psychological distress, personality traits, social inequality, transportation, mobility, built environment, wealth. And there's an in-home questionnaire that focuses on short diet. Uh, it's a, like a food frequency questionnaire. We'll talk about that in more detail in a moment as well. Satisfaction with life, the ADLs and IDLs, and care and caregiving. So you can see it's incredibly robust data collection that we have in terms of looking at nutrition risk in relation to some of these other um, variables. The short diet questionnaire specifically has 36 items. It's a frequency only frequency question, food frequency questionnaire, which includes the day, the week, the month, and the year, the consumption during those time frames. It looks at all four, all, all of the four food groups, emphasizes whole grains and omega-3 eggs, types of oils, and looks specifically low and regular fat dairy and calcium fortified foods and fluids. So it's not a comprehensive food frequency questionnaire which we might have seen in other smaller cohorts, but when you think about this as being done with 30,000 people, it's extremely robust to look at key 
healthful behaviors that can promote um, improved health outcomes. In the CLSA tracking, which is the 20,000 people that are being involved who are not getting the physical measures being done, these are the measures that are being collected. And so there's some overlap, obviously, so we can look at these groups in combination. And just to emphasize here that the screen two is being used as well as a fast food frequency questionnaire, a food insecurity questionnaire, and a teen coffee consumption question. So it picks up on some of those items from the uh, diet, short diet questionnaire as well. So on to screen two. There are 14 items in the screen, the full version, and those that are highlighted here in blue with an asterisk uh, showing are those that are the abbreviated version, which is used in the CLSA. So we have a sense of weight change, skipping meals, appetite, eating alone, fruit and vegetable intake, fluid intake, swallowing, and cooking difficulty. These measures can be used as a continuum, as a scale for nutrition risk, but they can also be used as an independent variable in terms of looking at, say, for example, appetite on its own as a predictor of something like a fall in the future. It has its robustness, though, in that it is um, a valid and reliable measure as used as a screening tool for the eight items. This is an example question, which is the fluid question. It asks, um, how much fluid does a person consume in a day and gives examples of those fluids that would be considered. And you can see why it's, it's, it's potential to see change over time because we have response categories that give a range of response. And so if you remember back to the Manitoba follow-up study, um, they could see the difference in individual items that occurred over a period of time to see where improvements were made that reduced the risk of some of their participants. So just to the validity and reliability of screen to the abbreviated version specifically, we use the criterion of a dietitian ranking nutrition risk using a standardized framework to identify what we were considering nutrition risk in, in the uh, validation study of screen to abbreviated. The cut point of less than 38 out of 48 total score has a relatively good area under the curve and relatively good sensitivity and specificity for a screening tool. You can see that interclass inter correlation is quite high as well. In terms of discriminant validity, that's been shown in the CCHS 2008, where the screen to abbreviated version was significantly associated with things we would think to be determinants of poor food intake, such as income and living alone. We also know that the screen to abbreviated has predictive validity. The PREVENT study, which was conducted back in the early um, 2000 time frame, Screen 1 was used in this data collection, not screen 2, a slight variation for, the, um, for some additional items around weight, body weight change. But essentially, the abbreviated version of that tool also was able to predict 18-month mortality. It was an independent predictor when accounting for age, gender, perceived health, living alone, and a history of inside falls, which were also in, um, associated with uh, deaths over 18 months in bivariate analyses. The hazards ratio was quite good, and it was the only other significant variable outside of age when put into the model as, as uh, with all the other variables. In terms of health-related quality of life, looking specifically at good health days in that data set and whole life satisfaction, a multivariate model is used for repeated me measures, and low risk had an on average two better health days per month, and it was significantly a predictor of health-related quality of life as well. So there is the predictive validity the discriminant validity, the criterion validity, as well as reliability of this screen to abbreviated version. And just to show you here, this is the abbreviated version looking at the, um, the proportional hazards for death. And you can see that those who had risk were more likely to die over the 18-month period, the green line there, versus those who had, uh, did not have the same risk. So in terms of some research questions that might result from using uh, screen two, as well as the short diet questionnaire, the 37 item, or the 36 item uh, food fixity questionnaire in the CLSA, there's lots of questions. And I have just put up some that I thought of as a researcher in this area. In terms of measurement, um, hand grip strength, for example, um, is, is used often in a nutrition assessment. And we're getting more and more um, seeing more and more the utility of that measure and understanding what it can mean in terms of muscle strength. 
and and uh, and masks for the um, in terms of the individual who might have malnutrition. And so there's the utility of perhaps looking at hand grip strength and its construct validity in relation to other uh, variables as well as in relation to screen to abbreviated uh, version, for example, which hasn't been done yet. We can also look more at the screen too in terms of predictive validity and concert validity, looking for discrimination among specific groups and how that might be more robust than our current sample that we have to date in terms of some of the data collection that's been done. The healthy eating patterns based on the diet questionnaire can actually come up with um, some brief tools perhaps based on that 36 item food frequency questionnaire that might say something about um, the healthfulness of diet and develop new indices around uh, diet based on these food frequency questionnaire items. And we might even be able to come up with some sort of healthy living indice, for example, which might be a combination of a variety of measures within the CLSA data collection that has something to say about nutrition of the older adult. And when we think about analytical uh, questions, so looking for associations, for example, or um, uh, uh, in terms of temporal relationships, looking for something that happened before an outcome, longitudinally as well. There's several questions that I have thought about, and just some of them are here on this slide for you. But for example, factors that influence food choice. Um, there are some theoretical models out there around food choice for the general population as well as for older adults, and those need to be uh, validated and updated to make sure that they truly are giving us a full sense of what is the the determinants of food behavior and food choice in older adult populations, especially as they age and over time. There's a potential to have qualitative subsidies that come out, out of the uh, pulling a subset, for example, out of the CLSA. So perhaps to identify recently widowed um, individuals in the CLSA data set, there might be the opportunity to then do qualitative studies around monitoring and, and getting a sense of how they adapt to their new um, situation with eating. And this actually comes out of um, a doctoral work of a, a PhD student who just defended a couple weeks ago. She had done this work and, and we saw this opportunity as a, a next step for the CLSA and for her work and moving forward these ideas around understanding that behavior better. Oral health and food intake, there's very little data on oral health and so this robust uh, data collection around oral health in the CLSA will give us an opportunity to look at food intake behaviors as well as nutrition risk in a way that we have not been able to do so before. The built environment and mobility and how they may impact nutrition risk as well as personality, how that may impact food intake and change in food intake over time as well as nutrition risk as well as life, life satisfaction and how nutrition may be part of that. Longitudinally thinking about predicting health-related outcomes like falls or hospitalization. So we'll have a much more robust data set than ever before. No longer convenient samples, but this population sample giving us a sense of how nutrition risk is an independent predictor and, um, and how big an independent predictor it may be in the, these outcomes that we're interested in. Predicting psychological outcomes as well, such as satisfaction. And also what predicts keeping that diet resilience going over time as people age. That's really important for us to know to understand who can be resilient despite having potential risk factors that would lend themselves towards potentially poor food intake, but for some reason these individuals are resilient. So understanding that better might lead us to intervention ideas for older adults and how to support individuals to be resilient. So in summary, I think we have an unprecedented opportunity to study nutrition risk and diet quality in a very large longitudinal cohort. Valid measure of nutrition risk appropriate for this population which is upstream and giving us that then a sense of nutrition risk that might be modifiable is something unique to this data set as well because screen 2 has been used as compared to some other screening tool. The diet questionnaire itself gives us uh, an ability to focus in on food quality and frequency of key food items that we believe to be helpful to promote the, the health of and uh, quality of life of older adults. And finally, because of the very diverse data collections being conducted as part of CLSA, we're going to have a much more holistic view of health and thus the opportunities to support, explore analytically some really unique research questions we have not been able to explore to date. So thank you very much for your attention, and if we have any questions, we can... Great. Thank you very much, Heather, for the excellent presentation. And as you said, now it's time for questions. So if anybody from the audience has a question, please utilize the chat feature and type in your question, and I will read it out to everyone and uh, elicit Heather's response. 
So while we're waiting for uh, people to type their questions, uh, just a general question. When I give my students in my Intro to Epidemiology course the module on nutritional epi, I talk about some of the challenges of measuring food and dietary intake, such as uh, recall bias. It's very difficult for people to remember uh, even what they ate last week, and you can perhaps overcome that by giving them 24-hour food frequency questionnaires almost every day, but then they start to not fill them out. So how are some of those challenges dealt with um, in the nutritional epi community? Yeah, that's a great question, Mark. And and, um, and so nutrition, first off, status is complex to measure. And diet within that, and all of the components, if you remember back to that circle that I showed, all of those components in there are also difficult to measure, and diet specifically can be very challenging. So um, when we think about diet, there's, there's limitations to every single measure we can use. And so doing a combination of measures such as uses in the CLSA is the way to go. And when you have a sample size of 50,000 people, you have to think about what do we really need to know and what's going to give us the kinds of information we want to move forward with. And so often in very large samples, you then use a food frequency questionnaire because of that challenge of doing a robust data collection of a single day, for example. Um, a single day on its own isn't very meaningful um, unless you have at least a subset of a data of a, of a sample where you can get a sense of that variation. Um, but then it is still just a single day for the majority of folks, and so it limits what you can say about individuals. If you want to say something about a population, a 24-hour recall gives you quite a nice uh, ability to do that. But it doesn't allow you to look at, in some ways, some of the things you might want to look at in terms of individual associations. So a, a person, for, for example, who might be um, having hospitalization down the road, a 24-hour recall a year before they say very little about that. But something like nutrition risk, the screening tool that is being used, we know predicts that. So it should be a better measure of what's going on nutritionally for that individual. So diet alone can be very uh, challenging to be able to link to key outcomes unless you have a robust data collection for diet. And that usually takes many 24-hour uh, recalls to get a sense of that for the individual and to understand their eating behavior. And so um, often what we see will be three 24 recalls. And to collect three 24 recalls takes a lot of effort and a lot of time to analyze that data properly. So it's a very expensive uh, initiative. So in 50,000 people, it's very, very challenging to do, to do that and, and why the choice was not made within the CLSA to do that. Great, thank you. Uh, a couple of written questions. What is the availability of blood samples? So CLSA is collecting blood samples from people who agree to give a blood sample amongst the 30,000 group that's getting the in-home and data collection site visits. Those blood samples will not be available yet, at least that's my understanding, sometime in 2015. Uh, anyone interested in accessing CLSA data, I refer you to the CLSA website where you will find specific web pages dedicated to providing you with information about uh, CLSA data that are available, data that will be available in the future, and also uh, the website gives you the procedure for going about uh, requesting access to the data. Uh, another question here, there has been some research discussing whether saturated fat really has an impact on cardiovascular disease risk. And the poster is asking if you could comment on that. Well, I'm not a saturated fat expert, I can tell you that first off. And so I've seen some at work too that suggests that perhaps we've overemphasized saturated fat um, and it may be other things that we need to be looking at in the diet, such as the trans fat, et cetera. And so I would have to defer to say I, I don't have um, a sufficiently educated opinion to be able to say do we reverse our, 
our commentary at this point around, or education at this point around saturated fat. There certainly is controversy, I agree, and we need to look at um, some of the new data collection that's coming out around the importance of saturated fat on its own as a predictor of cardiovascular disease. Great, thanks. The next question, what do you think is the most effective intervention for improving nutritional status in the elderly, yeah, not institutionalized? Yeah. So I guess that That's means... That's a great question. And, um, and, and uh, I would have to say eating with other people is probably the most important thing. We know that when people eat with others, regardless where it is that they eat, they eat more. Um, that social facilitation supports food intake, it supports mood, it supports quality of life. And so having older adults involved in eating with others, whether it be family, whether it be at a congregate dining site, whether it be a church group, whatever, those are key parts of, of uh, helping them to eat better. And then I think my second point would be to have older adults realize that their nutrition can impact their health. There's many older adults who, who don't see that as, as that link is there. They may have seen it when they were younger, thinking that, yes, I need to eat well if I want to work, for example, have the energy to do work, but they don't recognize that their nutrition needs are actually, in terms of micronutrients, the same for most of the nutrients that, uh, that we are recommending in terms of required nutrients. They're the same at their age of 85. And so they need to have a more nutrient-dense diet than they would have had in younger years, and most of them don't realize that. Great, thank you. Uh, another question, uh, when do we anticipate the first wave of nutritional information will become available from the CLSA? So any data that have been collected in the 30,000 group, that's the in-home interview and data collection site visit group, those data are expected to become available sometime, I believe, in the spring of 2015. Uh, okay, so another question. You're being thanked for a great presentation. And then how much Canadian data is available for the eldest of the old? So we're talking people between 80 and 85 years or uh, greater. Yeah, I, th I think that's a limited data collection group. So if you look at the CCHF 2008, you don't see very many of those people in that data set. Um, and in the new as well, they had a, it was a healthy cohort that they were starting with. And so you don't see those very oldest old. And, and so we're limited often to convenience samples for that group. And so Alain Payat, who's um, a researcher like myself at Sherbrooke, has done a lot of research in older adults attached to home care, for example, who are vulnerable. I've done a little bit of work around vulnerable older adults in that PREVENT study. So it tends to be just these convenience sample studies that gives a, a, a demonstration that we definitely have a, a highly vulnerable group around nutrition risk and potentially malnutrition, depending on what the measures are that have been taken, that are um, are significantly uh, challenged when it comes to nutrition, maybe even malnourished. And so that group may or may not be um, in the large population studies in the way that we would interested in. Perhaps Mark can maybe answer that a little bit further if there's any targeted um, recruitment being done for that oldest group. Right. So uh, CLSA has an upper recruitment limit of 85. We've gone above that uh, perhaps maybe uh, by a year or so. and anyone recruited into the CLSA in uh, the highest of the age groups, so we're doing 45 to 85, so if they've been recruited into the CLSA at 80 or 83 or 84, we'll follow them for as long as they're around for us to follow them. Uh, but I don't have exact numbers of people who would fall into the upper uh, stratum of uh, our age groups. But, but they are there, and uh, like I say, we'll follow them for as long as we can. Mm -hmm. I think there's uh, something to be said that perhaps we'll find some survivors in this sample, too, that we don't see in the typical convenience samples where we find people in, in community agencies where they're going to be more vulnerable automatically. So there is this potential with the CLSA to find people that have had good behaviors and are surviving long term, and that's understanding perhaps the importance of diet to that survivorship. Excellent. Okay, so are there any other questions from anyone? I think we've answered all the questions. Oh, okay, there's one. I did not see it. Uh, could you please comment on the general policy on data sharing in the future? 
particularly thinking about researchers outside Canada. So I don't know if that's a question about data sharing with respect to the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging. Certainly, uh, international researchers will be able to complete data access requests and uh, obtain CLSA data. That That's certainly uh, an avenue that uh, is open to international researchers. Uh, I don't know, Heather, if you have any thoughts on that question. No, unfortunately, I don't. With respect um, to nutrition research? With respect to nutrition I don't, research? Yeah, I, I don't. I don't know of any research that's open to external or international researchers. Um, it'd be best to contact the, the individuals that might be involved. I don't believe the Stats Canada data would be available outside of Canada. Is that I'm correct? honestly not sure myself. But uh, I think um, new eyes, you'd have to talk to Alain Pat, but I suspect it's not available to people right. outside of Canada. And the Canada. intent for CLSA is to make the data available. That's my understanding. So. Heather, thank you very much for agreeing to uh, present today. It was a very informative and interesting presentation. And uh, we really, really, really appreciate uh, your uh, presenting it to us. Great. Thanks very much, Mark. Great. So uh, this will be the last webinar for 2014. Uh, the CLSA webinar series will relaunch in 2015. And we will send out notices once we have our next set of speakers booked. Thank you, everyone.